This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 45, for August 14th, 2009. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and it's time for another TWIV, all about viruses. It's a beautiful day again here in New York City. And around the virtual table with me are Dick DePommier. Hey, Vince. How's it going, Dick? It's going well. Very well. Also, Jennifer Drehas is back. Hi, Jen. Hi. I can't see her. She's behind me. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I know she's here. Actually, this is not a virtual table. This is a real table. But it is a real, Alan is, real table. Alan is at the virtual table That's right. in the forests of western Massachusetts. Deep, dark. Yes. Deep in the forests of Western Massachusetts, right. and you can't see me either. I'm obstructed. Yeah. I can't see you. I can hear your weed whacker, though. Yes, that's right. He's got his camo pants on. Do you, do you put camo on to go weed whacking? No, no. I just wear an old pair of jeans. Okay. Watch out for the poison ivy, Alan. It's, uh... if, if I were in New Hampshire, I'd probably put on camouflage. So. Uh-huh. <laughs> Sorry, a little yeah. New England joke there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And New England, nothing is little. <laughs> okay, we have another great bunch of virology stories today, and a couple of them were sent in by listeners, which is great. Um, and the first one, well, before we do that, whose birthday is it today? It's got something to do with um, magnetic personalities or magnetism. It's just well, or... it's a scientist. I, I believe it's... <laughs> Hans Christian Ordsteed. You know, Orsted. that's, you know, when no, you've got a new I, PhD I just, student uh, sitting here, uh, just got her first paper accepted to the Journal of Virology. Let's all. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's not an easy deal. Yeah, Jen is back. Because she's supposed to be gone if you remembered our conversation. <laughs> I was. And I'm, I'm supposed to be clearing off my lab bench as we speak. But, but um, she was drawn to was the uh, light by oh, electromagnetism. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Our magnetic personalities. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, so the the birthday, courtesy of Google, is Hans Christian Orsted, who was a scientist. So we mention him, and we'll give you a link so you can see what he did. But there's a picture on the Google page today showing what he did. Of course, that's today. When you hear this, you won't see it any longer, but uh, the link will still be there. Roger from Australia sent this email. Hi, Professor. I'm sure you have heard, but there's a new Hendra outbreak here in Australia. Below is a link to the news shown yesterday. Keep up the great work. Love the podcast. So the link is to an article in an Australian newspaper. Hendra horse workers await testing. There's another outbreak of Hendra in Australia. We talked about Hendra a long time ago. Hendra is named after a city or a suburb of Brisbane, right? Yep. Right. A lot of the viral infections are. Yeah, they are often named after geographical locations. We've got Kaksaki virus right up over here. <laughs> it's true. I just blogged about that on Monday. Okay. I took a picture of it while I was driving up there Excellent. last week. I'm sure you didn't see that, though. I, I actually did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Two out of three. I've been, I've been meaning I... to do that for years. Every time I lecture medical students about it, I go, you know, upstate there's this town, and I always wanted to show them a slide, and I never had it. But this past trip up, I got the camera, and I took it. Excellent. And then I figured I would blog about it. Yep. So you, you took a picture of the sign? I took a picture of the sign on the thruway, right. It says Coxsackie, Ravenna. Because there's nothing else to see in Coxsackie, I don't think. No, <laughs> no, there's nothing else. You can't even see the viruses. No. Right. But Coxsackie virus, and Hendra also named. But what, here's a, here's a question. What virus, whose vir, which viral name was changed because the people after which it was named didn't want it named after that? Four Corners? Sin Norwalk. Sinombre, yeah. Norwalk. Well, yeah, Sin Four Corners, Norwalk. Uh, actually, Sin Nombre was first Muerto Canyon, uh. which is near. It was a canyon in near the Four Corners where uh. it, was, it was isolated from a mouse, a hantavirus, and they didn't want it named. That's Muerto named canyon. after the Hantan River in Korea, by the That's way. That's right, and they changed it to Sin Nombre, which I think was a really good. It's a great name. Nah, yes. no name, right? No name. That's right. So they're saying. Mm, you don't want us to call it after Muerto Canyon. And then there's but then Norwalk. the people of the neighboring town of Sin Nombre got right <laughs> Or Nombre. Actually, the Nombre's got after them. Right. The town of Sin Nombre. Where That's is right. that? 
And then Norwalk, what state is that, Dick? It's Ohio. I thought it was Connecticut, but it turns out to be okay, Ohio. Okay, you finally got it right. Well, yeah. Well, they they left it uh, they did. Norwalk. They didn't change that. And then West Nile, of course, the West Nile virus. They haven't changed that. Yeah, but it, so the only one I know about is Muerto Canyon, C. Yeah. There are probably others, but um, yeah, it's it's customary to either name it after geographical location or... Or maybe the disease that it causes, adenovirus, rhinovirus. What's interesting, Lyme polio. disease hasn't changed its name, and that's a fairly upscale community. I'm surprised they haven't objected to this in mm-hmm. some way. Any thoughts on that, Alan? Um, I don't know. There are a bunch of places in New England that have uh, naming issues. There was just recently a dust-up with um, the town of Athol, Massachusetts, um, but that was not related to a virus. No. Right. Anyway, Hendra... Um, it's a paramyxovirus, right, guys? Yep. We'll take your word for it. <laughs> what, all right, what other virus, well-known virus, is a paramyxovirus? Jen. Take it, Jen. <laughs> um, I know that uh, Sendai virus is, but... Yeah, very you know. good. Sendai? Oh, I have had some experience with Sendai virus. Yeah. I, I was uh, carrying Sendai virus on the... On the uh, subway here in New York right. from one university to the other, bringing it to lab. And I just thought, hmm, if this got out on the subway, maybe we'd get rid of, you know, our rodent yeah. population. But uh, I thought maybe I shouldn't do that. No. Rodent no. pathogen. Yeah. Do that. Also measles virus, uh, mumps, mumps. respiratory yep. syncytial virus, big family RNA viruses, negative stranded, enveloped. And Hendra is a relatively new one, discovered not very long ago, Right. What's the year? 1994, because some uh, 13 or 14 horses at a stable in Australia, in Hendra, uh, became ill. Some of them died, and there was also one horse trainer who died. Mm. And then the vet who took care of those horses, remember he emailed us mm. a few weeks ago. We have to get him on one of these days. Absolutely. It would be nice to do that. Now, uh, so here we have, there have been a couple of outbreaks of the same virus in Australia since then. So now we have a few horses uh, dying and infected. So Vince, here. is the horse native to Australia? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Dave. These are marsupial horses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of things that happen when you bring in strange animals to a familiar place, and that's one of them. Uh, so the the racing horse is not even a, a wild animal, right? It's totally bred to be. Arabian. Well, there are Arabian horses that are wild still. Yeah, but, but I'll bet they don't look anything like the racing horses. No, all but right. all the horses of North America came from Spain. So what's the reservoir of Hendra in Australia? Lying foxes? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So another the, bat related. You could blame it on a bat. Yeah. yeah you could blame it oh, on a yeah. bat. So apparently after that first outbreak, they uh someone did a survey of wildlife and they found forty seven percent of the of the fruit bats seropositive for the virus. Hmm. They looked at forty seven species and all, fruit bats were the only one positive. Wow. Virus. So if I lived in Australia and I wanted to avoid Hendra virus in my horses, what would I do? Well, that's a good question because we have another article called... I have the answer. I wouldn't have virus... asked you that question unless I had the answer for it. <laughs> how does the virus get from the flying foxes to the horses? But anyway, you're, what's the answer to your question? What I would do is I would locate all the race horses and all the race horse venues south of the range of fruit bats. That solves the problem. Well, that, economically, that's just not going to happen, No, it, of course not, because why? Right. Because they call from Brisbane up to Cairns the Gold Coast, mm-hmm. and that's the resort area. That's like the Florida of okay. Australia, sure. and that's where the racehorse industry is. So in, in connection with this recent outbreak, I forgot how many horses have been infected here. I think there's been one death. And this is, a, this is in the news because horse, horse racing is, is money, right? But if it was just for the Australian horses, it probably wouldn't be a problem. But that's not how racehorsing works. Yeah, they go, they move around. Of course they do. And somebody from Europe that has a thoroughbred see, is not yeah. going to want to go to Australia and yes. get their horses killed off. Yes, exactly. And that's well, there's also the issue that this can this can transfer to humans. Of course. Yep. It makes them sick. But it's also true for West Nile in this country. It's a very potent killer that's right. of horses. That's why we have a vaccine. That's right. right. But how do the um, viruses get from the fruit bats... To the racehorses. Droppings. There's actually an, ar- an article here. I would guess droppings and then... And it says that they're puzzled. Well, in fact, they found virus in the urine and feces of the bats. Right. So how would that get to the horses? Well, it depends on how close the horses are to the mangroves. 
and to the mm -hmm. uh, mango. I meant to mangoes and the, the fruit trees where the bats are actually feeding. So here's a headline from The Australian. Scientists flying blind over deadly virus. Scientists are still stumped about how flying foxes transmit the Hendra virus to horses, but it's probably from urine. Yeah. And you know, in, uh, there was another article I came across where they wanted to cull the bats. <laughs> now, what do you think mm. about that? Uh, personally, they should cull the horses. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, that's not going to happen, Dick. No. Is it of any use to cull, to cull a wild animal? No, because, because saying no. Well, I can tell you what their other problem is there, and they can't do that even. They had uh, domestic pigs that have gotten loose in Australia, and now they've got about three million wild pigs that run wild up in the upper part of mm -hmm. Australia, and they they have regular patrols that go out and kill thousands of them, but they must they have to kill millions to get rid of them, and they can't get rid of them. Yeah, Australia has a whole long list of invasive species problems. Correct, starting with humans. With yes, yeah, so starting with humans. <laughs> yeah, sure. Who wiped out all the forests, right? Right. Well, but I mean, it's with something like flying foxes. These are these are native to Australia, of right? Of course. Yep. So they they would have a better chance of eliminating them, probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, because probably already wiped out a significant yep. portion of the habitat. The um, Morton the Morton River runs through. Uh, Brisbane, and actually, I've I've taken a boat trip up the Morton River to see the fruit bats, and they're quite astounding to look at. They're huge, right? They're, they're as big as a fox. Hmm. <laughs> they're enormous. Why isn't culling a wild species effective? Because you can't get them all. Basically. Yeah. Now, in some cases, culling works, like chickens and turkeys when they have That's avian influenza. They're That's domestic. Right. They're on farms. You just wipe out all your holdings. That's correct. Right? Cows in the UK when they had mad cow disease, right? Yep. Yep. Or foot and mouth. That's the other issue is even if you got them all, I mean, there are there are certainly cases of wild animals where we did get them all, mm -hmm. um, even though it wasn't part of yeah, it. Yeah, passenger specific. pigeons, for yeah, instance. Yeah, passenger pigeons come to mind. The, uh, uh, the uh, great, great auk comes to mind. Yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, dodo bird. So, yeah, the dodo. These, these things can be wiped out. Um, but then the issue is, in many cases, you'll end up with... Uh, with secondary effects that you weren't expecting. So we don't exactly know how flying foxes fit into the entire ecology of the area. Right. Uh, this may be a very bad species to delete. So that yeah, <laughs> seems, like seems like a poor choice of policy. It may be controlling yep. something else that we're dependent upon. That's called right. an ecosystem service, and I, I yes. totally agree with you on that, Alan. Here's an a article from the Queensland Country Life. And uh, Hendra, what are the signs? Hendra virus is a zoonotic disease, which means it can transfer from animals to people. Right. They got it right. Yep. What are the symptoms? Frothy nasal discharge, temperature higher than 40 degrees centigrade, and neurological changes including abnormal muscle twitching, weakness, and loss of balance. Most cases involving horses are fatal, but occasionally a horse survives. So if you have a horse in Australia and it's doing one of those things, you should have it looked at, and don't uh, don't get near the frothing; it'll get it'll infect you. <laughs> yeah. So what are the signs uh, in humans? Yeah, they're they're encephalitis also in humans. Yeah. No you know. frothing, nasal. It's hard to tell. Sounds like a professor giving a lecture. <laughs> I don't know about the frothing. I'm curious. I, I bet the people don't never froth. Seen it's, that. A, it's a horse thing. Right. Horses, horses froth anyway. This is probably excessive yeah. froth. Vince, what's amazing about all of this is our, as we've taken this uh, twisted, tortured tour through viruses mm -hmm. over these last 40, how many are we up to now? This is 45. 45 yes, twivs. Not tortured. Well, uh, tortured meaning twisted, okay. not not not, not painful. painful. No, it's been wonderful. In fact, every time we've run across a bat-associated virus, my mind says, "Why don't these bats suffer from these viruses? Look at how horrible they are for humans!" And yet, yeah. none of the bats seem to suffer for, at well, all some, from these. Some of things. them suffer from rabies, right? Do they? Yeah, that's when they come out in the day and they act crazy. They have they maybe rabbit. we just don't have good surveillance of it. Maybe they are suffering. We don't know it. You think? Uh, absolutely. Wow. Well, we have a story like that okay. Then up. maybe I not with bats, but with another species. Yes. Well, you only know about what you've looked for, right? That's sure. Right. So, uh, the, uh, another thing I wanted to point out before we leave Hendra is that they've been giving the horses, the sick horses, ribavirin. And we have a story in another Australian newspaper. And I thought we would just mention what ribavirin is. Anybody know? We, we both have an idea. Yeah. But yeah. I just don't want to talk all the time. 
<laughs> Alan, why don't you answer this I, one? I, I just, <laughs> no, I'll let Vince take this. Uh, well, I think that it um, doesn't it cause mutations during uh, the replication cycle of RNA viruses. Right. Yeah, it inhibits. Uh, it's a uh, it's an antiviral that acts at the level of RNA synthesis. And the interesting thing about ribavirin is that it's active on against a large array of viruses. And for most, we don't know the mechanism, but it, it does act as a base analog. So it can behave like a uh, an adenine or adenosine or guanosine. And uh, so it can be, behave like either one. So it could get incorporated into a growing RNA chain when there's either a U or a C present. So not just one base goes in, but possibly another one. And so you get mutations. And so for polio, it's been shown that what the drug does is it kills the virus by mutating it to death. But the interesting thing about polio is that the virus already lives very close to the edge in terms of mutations. And all this does is push it up a few percent, this drug, and it's enough to be lethal. Yes. And it, whether it works the same way for other viruses isn't known. It's used, for example, for treating hepatitis C infections and other RNA virus. So anyway, they're giving these horses this. And, uh, of course, it's experimental because it really hasn't been used very much before. Um, but it probably works, or at least it inhibits the virus in cell culture. Okay, so it's an antiviral acts as a mutagen for at least some viruses. So it's essentially it's taking advantage, for those in the bleacher seats, it's taking advantage of the fact that, um, <laughs> that viral polymerases are less selective in, in many cases. Uh, they're, they aren't as attentive to what bases they're incorporating as the, the polymerases that are in the cell. Right. Yeah, normally there's, uh, these RNA polymerases don't, can't, can't correct errors they make. Right. Why would they have to? Because uh, they're dealing in numbers, right? Well, DNA polymerases, as you know, have error correction associated mm -hmm. with them. Um, but the RNA world doesn't, and they have greater variability. And this is a really good question because, you know, the variability helps you adapt to new environments, evolve. And I did a series of blog posts on this a few months ago, and one of the readers said, why don't DNA-based organisms get rid of error repair? What a great question, right? Huh. Because we have far lower error, but you would guess if we maybe if we made more mistakes, um, we'd evolve more efficiently. I don't know. But on the other hand, with a big genome, maybe you can't afford to make errors. Remember, all these viruses have relatively small genomes. So, well, the other thing is, for a multicellular organism, you need to have ongoing repair, or you get cancer. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of exactly. different ways of damaging yes. DNA. You can't. So it's yeah. quite different organisms, right? But even the small guys, you know, yeah. the small DNA-based organism. Yeah. Dick, name one small DNA-based organism. Um, Planaria? <laughs> oh, sure. So they have error repair. Why? Do they get they do. cancer? I don't, not that I'm aware of. Anyway, ribavirin. Okay, that's it for yeah. Hendra. And that brings us to <laughs> our friends at Citrix, the makers of GoToMyPC. Now, uh, as many of you know, we, we talk about go to my PC. It's a way of accessing all the files on your computer at work from somewhere else in the world. So if you have files on your computer, instead of having them to copy them to a hard drive before you go, traveling somewhere or even home, you just leave them there and leave your computer running. And go to my PC is a way of remotely accessing it. Now, some of you may be afraid of this because you think technology is daunting. I don't know, the, read, the listeners of a podcast probably don't feel that way. But if you do, you should try Go to My PC. It's built for non-technical people. It's really easy to use. Setup is, is completely automatic. You go to their website, you download the software onto your computer that you'd like to share, and then you get a code. And then from anywhere in the world, you go to a web browser, you put in the code, and you can access your desktop. Completely easy, totally secure, and if you have problems, free customer service 24-7 if you need it, but you probably won't need it because it works so beautifully. Now, you can try GoToMyPC free for 30 days. You just have to go to gotomypc.com slash podcast, gotomypc.com slash podcast, free 30-day trial. We thank them for their support. Our second story actually comes from Allison from uh, Philadelphia, and she writes, love the show and all the humor. 
<laughs> What's she listening to? Exactly. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen this. I just heard about it on the weekly New York Times science podcast, and I've copied the article below. Apparently, contrary to current beliefs, chimps do die from simian AIDS. I thought this was rather interesting. They collected samples from chimps in the trees by having a field assistant below them catch urine in a plastic bag held between a forked twig. Wouldn't you love that job? Makes lab work seem more fun. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, so this actually, this is a few weeks old, but uh, we are a little behind in our mail here at TWIV. And this is a very yeah, we're, nice... In fact, we're overwhelmed. <laughs> very nice story. It's fine. We like to be overwhelmed. Absolutely. Out of the lab of Beatrice Hahn, it's a virologist and specifically a retrovirologist uh, at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And she studies this relative of HIV, SIV, simian, simian immunodeficiency virus. Now, I, many of you may know that primates in Africa have two different kinds of, uh, well, oh, there are over 40 different kinds of uh, simian immunodeficiency viruses, and two of those have come over to humans at some point, and uh, that's HIV-1 and HIV-2. Beatrice Hahn studies these simian viruses in chimps in Africa, and one of the few people to do so. And it's always been thought that SIVs don't cause disease in chimps, and the virus that infects them is called SIV-CPZ for chimpanzee. This was never understood. Why should this virus not cause AIDS in chimps? Well, she's been studying these chimps for many years now. She has a couple of uh, chimp communities. Well, she doesn't have them, but they exist in Tanzania. Tanzania or Tanzania? Tanzania. Tanzania. I think you've corrected me before. Uh, only if you want me to. <laughs> anyway, there are a couple of communities... They're called habituated chimpanzee communities where all the, the animals are there. They're protected. They're tagged. And she and her workers go in and they collect specimens. And she found many years ago that you can collect feces and urine from these chimps and you can find virus in it. So you can sequence the virus and compare the isolates from different animals and see how they're related. So she's found, for example, that you can tell that Different chimps are infecting each other. And if you look at these chimps over the years as new chimps are born, she could tell, for example, that uh, a baby chimp when born is not virus positive and that it becomes virus positive shortly thereafter, maybe by getting the virus from milk, from mother's milk. So she's gone back often over many years and isolated multiple times viruses. And initially, they didn't think that these chimps were sick but in this paper now, she finds that uh, some of them do get AIDS, an AIDS-like disease, progressive CD4-positive T-cell loss, lymphatic tissue destruction, and death in some of the animals. And uh, it, I heard her talk years ago, and she was talking about how they figured out that you could get virus from urine and feces. You know, the chimps live up in the trees, and she says one the first thing they do in the morning when they get up is they pee out of the tree. And they found that you could hold a bag underneath a plastic bag and collect the urine if you're up when the chimps get up, and then you can get virus from it. And the feces they can get on the floor, and you you know who's living up up in the tree, so you can tell which chimp the feces. But she said urine is better because you can see which chimp it's coming from. You could look at them and look at the tag through binoculars, so you collect the urine in the morning. I thought that was great. So you isolate virus, you sequence it, and you can do phylogeny. You can tell where the, how the viruses are transmitted. Uh, but in this study, they... So she's been doing this since 2000. Hmm. And then they track the, the chimps, and they find that some of them disappear. They die. Uh -huh. And they, they could track a lot of these chimps, and they could get actually bodies of some of the dead chimps. And they found out that... The, the, the death is associated with uh, an AIDS-like disease. I wonder if bonobos get this. Don't know. It's like, it's like a chimp, right? It's a kind it's of a, chimp. It is a chimp, but they solve their conflicts in a very interesting way. Do they shoot each yeah. other? No, no, they all have sex. <laughs> nah. it, it's are you true. serious? Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm dead serious. Okay. So I would expect that... It's one of the only matriarchs. Yeah, exactly. I mean, males with males, females with females, males with females, it doesn't matter. What the sex is, as long as there's a conflict, it's resolved with a sexual contact. So this would, 
I think, devastate the bonobos if mm. SIV ever Maybe. got into that situation because obviously it's a sexually transmitted disease. Oh. So here they said during the nine-year period, seven of 17 infected and 11 of 77 uninfected chimps died or disappeared. So that's part of the evidence that this being infected kills you. When they said disappeared, they mean they were found and then they prove this because there are lots well, of... Well, they found, they found some of them. Some There's of them, a lot of predator species out there, kids. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. No, no, they, but the ones, the ones that they found, they right. found uh, consistently lowered CD4 okay. positive T cells. Right. And, uh, so. Well, that raises an interesting question, though, because an animal that's slower because they're sick is a target for predators. Right. So a lot of yeah, them must sure. disappear they before found one. they're... Sorry, yeah. That's right. Just wanted to finish No, no, the I, I agree, but... Here they have one case, one female they watched become infected, and they saw her get ill, and she died, and they had her body, at it, and they did an autopsy, and she had symptoms of uh, right. AIDS, I'm, I'm not doubting that. That's not the point of my discussion. That's all. That I think be... I think you're right. I think it's it's very difficult. To I tell. would think so too. I mean, I think in the, the abstract she says uh, immunohistochemistry and in C2 of postmortem spleen and lymph node samples from three infected and two uninfected chimps revealed significant CD4 T cell depletion, uh. high viral replication. One female who died had findings consistent with AIDS. So most of the data is associative, right? They only have one right. body that they could look at, but you will bet that this they will look at this more carefully oh, sure. in the future, right? Yeah. So they conclude these findings challenge the prevailing view that all natural SIV infections are non-pathogenic and suggest that SIV CPZ has a substantial negative impact on health, reproduction, and lifespan of chimps. And they, they actually suggest that you know chimps are, are disappearing, that this may be contributing to it, not just them being poached or... Pre- predatored. What is what is the word? Predated. Predated. Eaten. 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 That's right. <laughs> Eaten. <laughs> That's pretty cool. What do you think of this, Jen, as a former retrovirologist? So were you brought up with the notion that SIV is not pathogenic? I was. And until <laughs> about two weeks ago, I, uh, I believed that. Um, no, we, it's it was just generally taught that uh, the SIVs are endemic but don't, don't cause uh, mortality for the, the yeah. chimps. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's not clear from this how, how quickly it does kill the right. chimpanzees. Yeah, and, and really just, about that too. your point is, is true, is that, is that it just might slow them down, it might make them a little sicker, they get, they get picked yep. off. Yep. So this one female who died, died within three years right. of being infected. Right. And how old was she when she died? Chimps live pretty long lives. That doesn't say, but I'm sure they know. Okay. Because it says here that they've been tracking this, these communities since... Um, 1960s, mm. and they have good records of everyone, births, deaths, and so forth. I mean, this I just, is... Uh, I just don't know how common dying from the SIV is if it wasn't noticed before, because yeah, sure. it seems like it's been watched, but well, it does I mean, show that it Jane Goodall, happen, who certainly. is best known for her work on chimpanzees... Here in the same communities, actually. Yeah, um, mm. took 25 years to discover that chimpanzees eat meat. Yeah. And I must tell you that as a former researcher on trichinosis, I could have found that out on day one by simply taking a muscle biopsy mm-hmm. and finding larvae in their muscle. Uh-huh. That's the only one way to get it, and that's by eating meat. So uh, it's interesting because she observed them for many, 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 many years before she observed them eating meat, and they, they eat meat regularly, especially right. their victims like baboons and other chimpanzees. Well, um, the interesting aspect, well, first of all, the... There aren't many of these communities to study, so we don't right. have a lot of subjects. Um, in the lab, if you infect chimps, they don't get sick typically, right, Jen? Right. You right. put a chimp SIV, and they're fine. They stay infected, and you have to take care of that chimp forever. They're, I mean, they're not dying within three years. Typically. But that's no. true for humans, no. too, though, isn't it? I mean, how long does it take for you to get sick from HIV? Once you've encountered. It depends. There are rapid progressors and there are ones that never get sick. Or some that take five or six I mean, years. Ten years, sure. I guess maybe that's, what we're, maybe that's what they're seeing in the chimpanzees. That could be. Sure. what I was raising as the yeah. Well, you know, some of these chimps have been infected for a long time now in the lab right. because you right. have to keep them. You can't sack them. That's right. You can't sacrifice them. Right. So I'm sure they're more than ten years down. But they may be, you know, that's one or a small number of chimps and they're in a lab. It's very different from being outside. That's true. Other, other things could impact on it. 
Sure. Right. And, and in a lab, they're probably not exposed to as many secondary pathogens that could take them out in the wild. Sure. Yeah. Anyway, that's cool. Um, it just shows what you can do with not just good virology, but going out in the field. Vince, you realize we've talked for over 25 minutes now and haven't even mentioned H1 <laughs> and one. <laughs> uh, you had to bring that up. I'm you? thrilled. I'm absolutely <laughs> thrilled that we didn't have to talk about it. It's actually one at the, one one uh, story after the next one. Ah, yeah. Because our next story is uh, something that Alan is going to love. It's actually by a friend of yours <laughs> at Science, Leslie Roberts. Yes, yes. Uh, type two polio virus is back. Yeah. Do you know this story, Alan? I saw this. Um, I, I mean, this this story was the first indication I had of it. I didn't. Uh... So type two was declared eradicated in 1999. Oh my! So you know there are three serotypes of polio. Uh. They all cause polio, and the vaccine that World Health Organization was using for eradication was a trivalent vaccine. And in 19, by 1999, they said there's no more type two polio, no more cases. So it's eradicated. So in many countries, they switched to monovalent type 1 and type 3 vaccines. Now, at that point, uh, when we say eradicated, we mean for real, like from the entire globe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so their criteria is no cases for a certain amount of time. Bad criteria. Uh, yeah. for, for a lot of viruses, there's a um, reservoir of the virus right. in nature. I, I thought for polio that there was speculation that there could be, but there was never one identified. Yeah. Does no. this give credit to that? Well, no. I, uh, <laughs> people, people are the reservoir. Yes. Yes. I bet it's a long right. line virus, though, right? It can live up to a year in uh, aquifers. It could be frozen, but uh, right. in, in Nigeria, which is where this story takes place, uh, I don't think that's Probably the case. Frozen. So there, yeah. yeah, there has been suspicion that there might be a reservoir in nature, but never proven. I don't think there is one. It's just people. So they switched to the monovalent types one or three. Now, what happened in Nigeria around 2003? They stopped immunizing. They stopped using the trivalent. Uh, the government, in fact, I have an interesting story. We'll link to. The government started mistrusting uh, Western products, so they said we're not going to use this vaccine. So they stopped for about a year, and the virus just went crazy. It came back. It had a lot of wild polio coming into the country. And then when they resumed immunization, they used the monovalent types 1 and 3. And then uh, I think the first case of type 2 polio was in 2005. Um, it was vaccine-associated virus, which means that the virus from the vaccine is causing this outbreak of type 2. And so we know that, I think we've talked about this, when you get immunized with the, these infectious uh, vaccine strains of polio, they, they replicate in your intestine and they revert to being able to cause polio again. Yep. And they spread and they can cause outbreaks. So this is what's happened here, this, this outbreak. And there are 130 cases so far this year in Nigeria. Is vaccine-derived type 2 polio virus? Wow. which was probably from the trivalent preparations that they were using in Nigeria before 2003, before they stopped. So it was circulating since then and probably in people. So this virus can circulate silently without any disease for many years. Mm. And then, boom, comes up. So 2005, it started to gain steam. There have been more and more cases each year. Now, WHO is very worried about it. So they're originally saying that it was eradicated was wrong because mm. the virus was still there. Have there been any cases of paralysis? I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. There have been cases of paralysis. Oh, yeah, these are, I think, all cases of paralytic disease. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Um, this shows you that it's very difficult to er eradicate a disease when you use a vaccine that can cause the disease, (laughs) right? (laughs) Particularly Uh, if people people who receive the vaccine who are immunosuppressed can then continue to secrete these virulent viruses for years. Sure. It's a big problem. So, in, in particularly in areas where you have a lot of a lot of um, HIV, uh, you've got a lot of people who are immunosuppressed. They've been vaccinated with the trivalent vaccine, and they're going to be secreting this yeah. virus um, possibly until they die. What do you think they're going to do to uh, get rid of this type two in Nigeria? What do you think is their strategy? Anybody guess? More national immunization days. Which which vaccine <laughs> are they going to use? Well, they'd have to use the. Um, uh, they'll probably use the trivalent oral right. vaccine. Yeah, that's what they're doing. In fact, I think they did a mass immunization from May to June of this year with the trivalent. But, of course, that reintroduces the type 2 in. Right. So you have this endless circle. What they really need to do is use inactivated. 
Exactly. Vince, Vince, are you trying to tell me what goes around comes around? I am. <laughs> I am. It's a, it's a the circle. Un- the unactivated um, vaccine isn't used mostly out of cost, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and cost, to, cost of the to, vaccine and cost of distributing it. And you, have to, and you have to inject correct. it. So it's really yeah. easy to distribute it in these countries. You just drip it in the kid's mouth, right? But uh, they say at the end the WHO is realizing now they're going to have to switch to the killed, mm-hmm. to the inactivated. You know, it would have been vaccine. nice if somebody had told them this years ago. Gee, you know, it's amazing, Alan, that no one did, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling there's a little touch of humor in that sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but How, not what, much. what year was that article that we wrote, Alan? That would have been 90, what was it, 96? 96. Yeah, Alan and I wrote an article, an opinion. It was published in Science saying, uh, you guys better switch to an activated vaccine or you're never going to eradicate. And the WHO published a rebuttal in the same issue saying, no, 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 there's no evidence that this is an issue. <laughs> that was Alan's uh, first foray into uh, <laughs> publicly visible science writing, right, yes. right Alan? Yes. Okay, so that's polio returns. And if you, I will post also, I've written a blog post on this. It'll be up Monday. So you can check that out at virology.ws. In our last story, we cannot stay away from H1N1. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which is still um, uh, circulating in the Northern Hemisphere, but it's gone down. If you look at the CDC graph, there was a big peak, and now it's all the way down, but still higher than usual. And of course, in the Southern Hemisphere, it's gone crazy. Especially in, in India lately, I've seen That's many, not many the cases. Hemisphere. Oh, sorry, not the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> not the Southern. In India, it's still going crazy, but um, other countries down under, it's still going crazy. Um, and uh, I found, I just wanted to point out a very nice article. There is a journalist in Canada by the name of Helen Branswell. Ever heard of her, Alan? I haven't. She writes for CP. Canadian Press. I guess that's sort of the equivalent of the Associated Press. Could be. And she has, I've read her articles in the past months, and she's a very good science writer. This article is actually a discussion of a paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, by Taubenberger and Morens. Taubenberger is one of the people who rescued the 1918 influenza virus back from uh, autopsy material. And the gist of this is, well, here's the, her title is Misunderstanding of 1918 may, may Lead to Faulty Assumptions for Swine Flu. And they're basically saying that this whole idea that there's a wave, multiple waves of flu in a pandemic with increasing virulence because of mutation is totally unfounded. And this is something we've talked about here it on is. TWIV. Oh. And um, they have now published this in JAMA. It's an opinion. Uh, and they say there's no reason to think that there was any mutation. We don't have any viruses to prove it. We only have one. And so I think it's important that people see this, even though we've talked about it. You may not believe us. So here now two experts are are writing the same thing. So that's a very good article worth looking at by Helen Branswell. Can we have one more addition to the virus stories? A brief one? Of course, Dick. I mean, I rarely bring one, but I can do that this time if you're interested. And that is that they're in three different places in the world as we speak. Mm -hmm. There have been three outbreaks of rabies. Where Mm. where are they? South Africa, the United States, Mm -hmm. um, and Ukraine. Is it from dogs? Uh, Is it from dogs? (laughs) No, no. The one in the United States was from an otter, Hmm. of all things. South Africa, Ukraine, and what was the other place? United States. U.S. It's on uh, uh, ProMed, on, okay. the, uh, on the homepage for ProMed. And, uh, you know, I've been interested in rabies because it's obvious that uh, it's a stoppable disease, right? Except you've got this wild cycle going on also. So getting uh, mm. the baits to the wild animals is a big, big problem. So in the U.S., uh, it's wild animal rabies? I'm sorry, you asked this already. I didn't hear yeah, it. Yeah, this one, this particular one was. Someone got bitten by a, an otter. An otter? An otter. Were they swimming? How, how close I don't know. I, I think if you go to ProMed, you'll find out what actually did happen. Um, I, I just see- saw the headlines, so I'm... I was thinking the roaming dogs that we talked about last, last <laughs> No, no, I think this was an otter, and otters are not that common, but right, So we have canine... Um, Rabies in South Africa. Right, that's a dog thing. And then rabies while... Oh, then we have rabies in the Ukraine. Right. Let's, let's take a look at that. 
778 rabid, rabid stray cats and dogs diagnosed in 2006, and that increased in 2007 and 2008. So that's a pet thing. they got to immunize their pets. But right. let's take a look at Rabies Wildlife USA. Yeah, Wisconsin, an otter. An Austrian, an Austrian tourist vacationing in Wisconsin got attacked. <laughs> uh, reportedly, she reports she was attacked by three otters. Three otters? Yes. That's incredible. Yeah, wow. She was, she was swimming. That's very unusual. Well, they would normally not attack you, I guess, because they were they run. I've... I do a lot of trout fishing, and otters like to eat trout. And I've encountered otters only twice in my whole time of fishing. Now, so we don't very actually shy, know, very shy. we don't actually know if this is rabies because um, the otters got away. <laughs> so she's she's getting I see uh, okay. she's getting vaccinated, but um, all right. This is maybe they were guarding their young. Yes. <laughs> well, someone commented at ProMed, it doesn't sound like rabies to me. The involvement of multiple otters and the mode of the attack sound as if the woman inadvertently swam into an otter raft that is a family of otters and was attacked right. by parents who were defending their young <laughs> in That's a very it. typical otter manner. And I'm waiting for someone to make a good joke. She reached uh, the otter limits. <laughs> no, I would have done it, but I ordered not it. <laughs> so it may not be rabies. And if we don't have the animals... All but right. she probably got immunized because you don't want to take any chances. That's right. Sure. Yeah, it's That's interesting. Right. Stay away from uh, otter rafts. That's, yes. That's the model of that story. Okay, Dick, thank you. Oh, that's okay. Let's go on to some email. The first one is, an, is a um, message I found on Twitter from XMAL. It's in Jen also found this. It says, Dvorak got hit on TWIV44. I like its style, but one must get the science right before wildly speculating. So I guess he likes the style of that podcast, right? Right. But you have to get it right. You're right. I'm glad they, someone picked it up. You do. Jim wrote, just another step towards moving the lab into my pocket. He sent a link called Cell Phones Turned into Fluorescent Microscopes. Ooh. Well, let's take Ooh. a look at this one here. Researchers uh, at the uh. University of California, Berkeley, are proving that a camera phone can capture far more than photos. They have developed a cell phone microscope or cell scope that not only takes color images of malaria parasites, but oh. of tuberculosis bacteria labeled with fluorescent markers. It's published in wow. PLOS One. How about that? They have this picture here of this uh, cell phone camera hooked up to a long tube. <laughs> it's Amazing. not something you're going to carry in your pocket, but it's smaller than the, than the fluorescent scopes we have. That's Absolutely. for sure. So this is for regions of the world that lack access to, uh, you know, diagnostic facilities. Or hmm. when our scope goes down again. Yes. Grab out the <laughs> Whip out cell your phone. cell phone. That's right. The engineers attached compact microscope lenses to a holder fitted to a cell phone. Using samples of infected blood and sputum, they were able to use the camera to capture bright field images of plasmodium falciparum. Which or Dick falciparum. Knows. It's not falciparum. It's either, either or. It depends on if you're from Britain. I see. Falciparum. I kind of like falciparum. And they also saw TB. Right. Well, that's neat. Well, there was a reader, a listener some weeks ago who wanted to hear more about virology and engineering. So here that is. And you can look at them on your phone. You can send the images to someone. So, you know, this is only going to get better with uh, improving devices. Now, it's interesting. They used... They used um uh, LEDs, I assume these are UV emitting LEDs, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, 460 nanometer, um, mm -hmm. as the light source. Uh, I'm wondering if you could use um, sunlight on a filter. Right. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. You might be able to do that too. You could do away with some components and just aim it at the, aim it directly, you know, up, because um, there should be plenty of UV in the sunlight. Oh, I see what yeah. you're Yeah, yeah, they did use an LED. You're right. Yep, it could be. I'm sure. I'm sure you could modify it. Yep. So thanks for that, Jim. That's very neat. Duncan is next. He writes, "Hi, I found Twiv via Twit, and am an avid listener. I'm just a web programmer, so no scientific background, but I find virology fascinating. I first got interested in viruses reading Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything, and have been hooked, infected since." 
It's a real treat to be able to listen to scientists on the forefront of research chatting about viruses, something only a select few got to do just a few years ago. So thank you, TWIV. I listen to TWIV with Google open to look up all the stuff I don't understand. I feel something like a kid in a candy store with all the information. That's good. That's a good way to listen. Hmm. Well, we do the show with Google open we yeah. do. in front of us. Oh, how else? <laughs> <laughs> I have a question and a request. My request is for some discussion around HIV. Here in South Africa, we have very high HIV infection rates, and some of the worst sure. disinformation. Our previous president was of that very small group who deny that HIV causes AIDS. Right. I believe there's a correlation between those two things. That's yes. right. Yeah. A stance repeated recently you mean former by former president and the misinformation. The, yes. Well, no, I, I, the misinformation <laughs> and the high rate of infection, I think, are connected. But. Ah, yeah. <laughs> A stance repeated recently by some health officials and our current president famously stated that showering will prevent HIV infection after unprotected sex. And besides, HIV seems quite interesting, given how fast it mutates and attacks the very cells that are supposed to attack it, almost like a grandmaster chess match between virologists and HIV. <sighs> Pretty neat. So we have talked a bit about HIV. We talked a little today, but uh, we'll bring Jeremy Luban back. Hey, hey get the word right from the man's mouth. My question is, if you guys know anything about the HIV vaccine trials being carried out here in South Africa, surely an HIV vaccine would be bigger news. Thanks again for a great show. So he sends a link to a um, Agence France Press, AFP story. South Africa tests first African-made AIDS vaccine. So they're doing human trials of this. Locally produced vaccine being tested in Soweto. And Cape Town, is that pronounced right, Dick? So we tell? Yes. And uh, let's see, what is the basis for this vaccine? 48 volunteers will take part in this study. Phase one trials, just which shows that the vaccine is safe, not mm -hmm. efficacy. Right. It was developed at the University of Cape Town. I'm not getting much mechanistic insight on it from the... Uh... Yeah, we don't know what, what it actually is. The problem here in... It is in the press, of course, but the problem is that there are many, many, there have been many other vaccine trials. And he says here, 30 are underway at the moment. And the most watched is the biggest ever study in Thailand in which 16,000 people are enrolled. And results are expected later this year. Um, some, so the South African vaccine uses a similar method, but they don't say what it is. We'll have to look that up. But I think there are many, many uh, vaccine trials for AIDS. And I, I have a, a publication I receive monthly, which just basically says most of them fail. Right. They're not effective. And that's why you don't hear much about them. Because the first ones got a lot of press, but since they haven't been working, they get less and less press. But when one works, you'll hear about it. So I think it's great that they're doing one in in Africa, but uh, that's that's the reason I think we're not hearing much about it. Any thoughts on that? Well, I know that Tony Fauci, when he uh, learned that the big uh, vaccine trial that he was in charge of failed, uh, mm -hmm. got very depressed afterwards. Saw very little hope for a, a vaccine soon. Yeah. And maybe never. In fact, the, the one Merck study they mentioned in this article, they, they had to stop because it looked like it was increasing <laughs> the rate of infection. Well, that might have also been due to the fact that those that were receiving the vaccine thought it was working and therefore they could have more unprotected sex. Yeah, there's actually, there have been yeah. mathematical modeling studies that even if you had a, a vaccine with pretty impressive efficacy, you, you uh, could very well increase the risk of infection mm. by that mechanism. That's right. Anyway, Duncan, thanks for the note. We'll keep you in mind. James writes, hello, TWIV guys and gals. <laughs> Here's a question for you, and perhaps I might be the first audio one. Well, here's hoping that, and, uh, okay, so it's our second audio one, and let's see. Hello, 12 guys and gals of prison. This is James from Wellington, New Zealand. I was recently taking part in an online discussion about flu vaccines when someone said they didn't get the vaccine because they thought that it could likely induce extra mutations in a similar fashion to the improper use of antibiotics, for example. A quick bit of internet research only brought up anti-vaccination pages espousing this, but no clear articles covering any of it. Now I know viruses can mutate to render antivirals ineffective or useless in the same fashion that antibiotics do, but can vaccines do the same thing, or does the me mechanism they use not increase the mutation rate beyond what is normal? 
a valid question. So he says, can a vaccine induce mutations like a drug does? So mutations occur in the life of a virus. They're not induced right. by drugs or, anti or antibodies. What the drugs or the antibodies do are select for uh, viruses that might be resistant. So uh, if you have immunity to influenza virus, you select for viruses that can escape the immunity. And whether that immunity is acquired naturally or by vaccination, you have the same kind of selection. So, yes, you do select for variants, but there's no way around that. If you get naturally infected, if you choose not to be immunized, you get naturally infected. You'll have the same or similar antibodies produced if you had gotten the vaccine, and you'll still select for antibody escape variants. Yeah. So. See. One another key difference, though, is that in the case of an immune response, you get a much more broad-based and robust response um, that tends to be harder for the virus to bypass with simple mutations. Mm -hmm. Although with flu, as we know, it does. With flu, right. With flu, of course, we get new strains coming out every year, and that's being driven by the immunity, presumably. Exactly. That's the point we have to make. The, yeah. the antigenic drift of influenza is driven by population immunity. Right. So if you have antibodies to last season's flu and you get this season's flu, uh, that virus will, the virus that replicated in you, there will be some that can escape the antibodies from blocking infection, and those will grow, those will reproduce and spread to others. So it's not a reason not to be immunized because right. getting a natural infection can have dire consequences. And it's worth noting that... Um bypassing, getting around immunity by, by changing your genome is not a strategy that every virus can pull off. Right. Uh, which is why we have, for example, polio, measles, mumps, rubella, et al. vaccines, yes. because those are viruses that yeah. just can't quite do this. Exactly. Right. Good point, yes. Or yellow fever. Yes. Or yellow fever, right. Yeah. There are many, many vaccines where you don't have uh, antigenic variation that, that can lead to this escape, so... It's very unique. Anyway, he says he sent some links to um, some blog posts where this issue was discussed, and we'll post those. He says, hope that helps put some more context behind the question. Keep up the great show. I think around 80% of it goes right over my head now, <laughs> but it's better than uh, the Mine too. <laughs> but it's better than the 90 plus percent when I started listening just before swine flu started, and this show has been invaluable in helping myself understand what's going on. Great. Ja Jesper wrote, Hi, hello, Vincent et al. After listening to the last episode and your discussion about a generic flu vaccine, presumably based on the M protein, I came to wonder about the incentive for pharmaceutical companies to develop such a one-shot cures-all vaccine. I'm not overly into conspiracy theories, but I do understand that every company wants to secure future income and a substance that once and for all eliminates the need for an annual $50 shot must be a questionable proposition. What is your take on the willingness of companies to develop and release such a vaccine in financial rather than scientific and altruistic reasons? This comes up a lot in vaccine development. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's a field. This In my work, I've often covered this very issue um, that, in fact, a lot of companies don't work on vaccines because as a business proposition compared to uh, compared to drugs that you can sell chronically for years and years, um, you know, vaccines are a pretty, pretty crummy investment. Um, it's, it's not as easy to make money off them. Um, but in a case like this, I mean, the economics of a one-shot flu vaccine would presumably be just like the economics of a one-shot uh, polio vaccine or a one-shot um, HPV vaccine uh, or any of these many, many other vaccines that are produced that, in fact, do manage to turn a profit year after year because you have more people being born and you're able to sell a steady supply. Yeah, that's the key. There, there are always people being born, so you have to use these vaccines. And there are plenty of one-shot, once-a-life or a few times vaccines, so economically yeah. it does work. And my take on this is that a lot of companies are willing to get involved in animal vaccine development, but not human vaccine development, because there are fewer hoops to jump through. And, and less, less liability. Lawsuits. Yeah. Right. And more animals yep. to immunize. You study the supply of dogs and cats, so distemper virus vaccine. And that if you remember some of these, uh, the West Nile vaccine, they suggest yep. every year you get it, the yeah, horse yeah. gets it, right? That's right. So. That's right. 
Okay. A follow-up question is why the immune system fails to become sensitive to the M protein by itself. That might be obvious to someone who has a deeper understanding of these things, but I am surely not one of the experts in the field, so some clarification would be useful. All right. So the M protein is actually the M2 protein uh, vaccine. The M2 protein is a, is a glycoprotein, a protein that's present in the envelope of the virus. It's only present in a few copies in contrast to the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase, which saturate the envelope. So there's much less of that protein to initiate an immune response. And that's why you don't have, in a natural infection, a good anti-M2 protein response. Now, some companies are trying to use M protein, and you would be injected with a lot more M protein than you would ever see during a natural infection. And so that might be a way of engendering broadly reactive immunity. Also, you mentioned a while back that a flu virus spreads better when absolute humidity is low and gave that as a reason to winter being the predominant flu season. It is my understanding that new strains typically stem from Asia. Having lived for a couple of years in Bangkok, <laughs> right. I, can, Pretty I, humid. <laughs> I can from firsthand experience state that the humidity is high all through the year with the exception of the rainy season when it's really wet. How come that is a fertile breeding ground and, more importantly, provides great or at least good spreading environment for new viruses? Yes, well, there is a problem with the humidity temperature <laughs> theory. <It doesn't laughs> seem to, and I've heard this from many people, including scientists and epidemiologists, who say it doesn't explain seasonality everywhere. Now, Dick, right. is Bangkok below the equator? Nope. No, huh? i got, I got to get a globe here in my equator. office. Okay, so uh, <laughs> well, I, I don't know. It's a good question, uh, Jesper. We don't know. Uh, in the, in, see, the, the humidity and temperature experiments were done with guinea pigs in a controlled laboratory environment, and the results are consistent with what we see in certain climates like northern U.S., but they're not consistent with the epidemiology everywhere. So the answer is it's not explaining everything. And there are obviously other issues like population immunity, which probably play into it, other pathogens other aspects of the weather, magnetic fields, <laughs> sunspots. I want to Sun see if you're awake. Business right? cycles. <laughs> okay. you know, if, it were, if it were sunspots, we'd be in a low, very, very low this period. Very right true. Now. Very true. Gotcha. All right. A couple more here. Jim writes again, Vince, I thought this was a beautiful podcast, just like those you are producing, suitable for many levels and types of listener. I think it would be excellent material for high school students. The website may be worth recommending, too, if it hasn't appeared on TWIV. And he's recommending um, a brain science podcast of Dr. Ginger Campbell, which was a very early pick of ours on TWIV. Great podcast. Dr. Ginger Campbell is an emergency room physician, and it's a great podcast. Go check it out. We'll put a link to that. Thanks, Jim. And now we have an email from someone named Cocooning. Who writes, hmm. Dear Twiv, I listen regularly to your podcast and having fun doing that. Thank you for the commitment and enthusiasm to share information with anyone in a light way. I have a question which is very important to me because I have a daughter of six years old. How do I know that the next mandatory vaccination against H1N1 may be safe? I read so many stories about adjuvants that kill or where you get all sorts of side effects. I would all like to believe that the government of the Netherlands will not put their population at risk, but I am obliged to my daughter to find out. Where should I start? I have no knowledge of virology. Thank you for reading my email. Mm. So he's worried about adjuvants. <coughs> Mythbusters, that's, that's where we come in. We're the Mythbusters myth myth busters on this one. Okay. First of all, not every uh, vaccine is going to be adjuvanted. Okay, I've... And I, I think that you have to find out if what you get has an adjuvant or not. Now, there's a nice um, article by WHO, which we'll post a link to, called Safety of Pandemic Vaccines. And it starts out by saying, WHO is aware of some media reports that have expressed concern about the safety of vaccines from pandemic flu. The public needs to be reassured that regulatory procedures in place for the licensing of pandemic vaccines, including procedures for expediting regulatory approval, are rigorous and do not compromise safety or quality control. And I would look at this article because it goes on to say, for example, this is a vaccine very similar to all the other flu vaccines that we've made, and they've been tested and used in many, many people. Right. Uh, and it goes through, they go through the procedures that are going to be used in Europe for the testing of these vaccines. So you can read about that. And they make the point some adverse effects will be coincidental because you're going to immunize so many people. So things will happen, but that doesn't mean that the uh, vaccine is causing them. So that's one good article to look at. And then I suggest looking at the CDC site, 
uh, novel H1N1 vaccination planning questions and answering. And it tells you a lot about uh, the vaccines that are coming up. And here are a couple of issues with respect to your question. Will the vaccine be adjuvanted? It is unlikely H1N1 vaccine will be adjuvanted. Definitive information will be available once clinical trial data are available. So this when, is a, did we, when did we turn adjuvant into a verb? I, know. I was just going to ask. <laughs> it's been used in the press, Alan. I've wow. seen it. But I, I, I agree that I don't, I don't like that. Adjuvanted. Yes. Well, as I, when I taught journalism, I used to tell my students, do not verb. <laughs> Very good. Here's another question. If the vaccine is adjuvanted, how will it be formulated? Formulation will vary by provider. Novartis vaccine may be pre-formulated with adjuvant for uh, CSL, GSK, and Sanofi Pasteur. Mixing of vaccine and adjuvant at the site of administration will be necessary. So those companies may have adjuvanted vaccine, and so you should see what your what your physician gives you. You can ask what brand is it, and I don't want an adjuvant if you're worried. Metamune vaccine will not be adjuvanted. Metamune is the live, uh, the infectious vaccine that you inhale. And so you could ask for that if you're worried about adjuvants. But I think that the, the bottom line is that the, any adjuvants are going to be extensively tested, and they won't be used if they're not safe. There is no reason why a regulatory agency or a government will release a vaccine with an adjuvant that is not safe. Would, would you all agree yep. with that? Absolutely. Yes. In fact, I would say that at this point, based on its recent behavior, at, at least, I mean, the question comes from Europe, but um, the FDA here in the U.S. is actually on a on a correction in the opposite direction. Um, they've had enough high profile screw ups, for want of a better word, that um, they're they're now cracking down on approvals of everything, uh, including both food and drugs, um, and and really trying to get better data in advance of releasing anything. So they're they're playing it cautious and are likely to continue, particularly with something as high profile as an H1N1 vaccine. Right. My, my biggest fear on this one would be that, uh, let's say there's a huge outbreak uh, in the fall and in the wintertime in the Northern Hemisphere, and we're, we run out of virus vaccine. And so some unscrupulous group starts to manufacture Erzatz vaccine. Just... <laughs> And that's not unheard of because of the uh, last time we talked on TWIV, we talked about fake drugs. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's no, there's no stopping people that have no scruples at all for making fake vaccine if they think they can make money at it. Yeah. And that's, that's where the uh, biggest problem is. So how do we get as, around that? I think you should check every bottle. This, uh, it has to have a stamp on it. It has to be sealed. And it has to have um, certain security uh, issues associated with it that the government can regulate. Well, you know, you're typically going to get it from a physician, right? And it's yeah. going to be in a multi-dosed vial. Yep. It's going to be difficult for people to regulate I that. understand that, but somehow you have to build that into the safety net. Otherwise, you're running the risk of these uh, unscrupulous... Yeah. Uh, well, right. But if you're getting it, if you're getting it from um, your local physician then the yeah. quality control is there. I mean, that's... No, the point is, I said, when it runs out. Yes. You won't be getting it from your local physician when it runs out. You'll be getting it on the street, or you'll be getting it from some guy that says, hey, psst, want some vaccine. Right, so just don't do that. <laughs> don't try it. Exactly. Well, Dick, what if you're in an airport and there's a kiosk there? Ah, well, Should that's... you take that? Uh, I had the opportunity of actually getting the vaccine in Chicago because they mm -hmm. had a, a kiosk there, Ooh. and uh, I, did, I passed it up. I didn't take it, but... Um, Maybe I should have. I hadn't heard about this. Did you talk on a previous TWIV? Yeah. The, the kiosks that have uh, vaccinations? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, wow, it was I set up by the public health department of Chicago, and it was offered free, free vaccine for anybody who wanted it. Well, see, I, that seems almost trusting in the sense that I, no one's making money exactly off that. Right, exactly yeah. right. Exactly right. Uh, I'd be worried about you know the, the, the secondary seller to the physicians buying it from a primary source, which is not approved. Well, remember, in the fall, we're probably going to have mass immunizations also outside of physicians' offices in schools, for example. That's so right. those will have to be tightly controlled. That's right. As, mean, they, that's, as they generally are. It's sad yes. to have to yes. bring it up as an issue because in yeah. the old days, we never even thought about this. But uh, in today's world, I think uh, we've got to consider every possibility. Sure. Yeah. Okay, Amy wrote, could you do an episode on recurrence of viral infections involving those viruses that one is supposed to get only one time? 
I contracted chickenpox twice at age four and again at age 21. The reemergence at 21 was in the form of chickenpox, not shingles. I'm waiting on that one. Uh, an- right. Another one would be Epstein. All right, so that's very unusual to get chickenpox twice. Yep. But in people that have poor immune responses, I would say that that could happen, right? It is possible. Yeah. yeah. So you may be somewhat immunocompromised, maybe, you know, very subtly, but that could be an early indication of and that. And you've got measles that can come back as SSPE and things well, like that. Well, that's okay because that happens in yep, that's a great occurrence, though. number of kids. But yes, but she says she got chicken pox got twice, okay. right? Another one would be Epstein-Barr virus. I got mono at age 12, wow. and I had a recurrence in January of 2007 at age 36 that lasted four months. My physicians theorized that because I had undergone three surgeries in one year, including one to remove a massively infected spinal cord stimulator, followed by large IV antibiotics, 20 grams a day, delivered by a PICC line. Pick. What's that? Pick line. Uh, it's direct into your... Um Vein. Your vein. Okay, yeah. for six yeah. weeks. My body's immune response was so weakened the Epstein Barr virus was able to reemerge. I still carry higher than normal titers for the virus. Do you mean virus titers or antibody titers? How common is this? As a grad student in biochemistry and molecular biology, I'm always wondering if I should take extra precautions with our bacteria and tissue culture cells than most. Love the podcast. Keep up the good work and say hi to Alan and Dick for me. Hey. Hi. <laughs> That's Amy, who's a graduate student hey, in uh, Oklahoma. Well, Epstein-Barr virus, you know, becomes latent after that first infection, and then it can reoccur and cause more. It can replicate and produce virus. Your B cells will produce virus, and that's how you can infect other people. And so, in other countries, you can get Burkitt's lymphoma. And you lymphoma. can get different uh, kinds of cancers, right? So it's not unusual for that to persist because it's a latent infection. Yep. Uh, but I would guess again that if you are immunosuppressed, if you're on massive, uh, if you have an infection or you have massive antibiotics which alter your flora, you could imagine having a higher than normal uh, recurrence of Epstein Barr infection. I think what she's really raising is a fundamental question about virology and infections. Mm-hmm. That when you're when you are cured in quotes of an infection, is it really gone? Well, you know, the chicken pox becomes latent also. That's why you get shingles later. It's very interesting in her case that she got chicken pox again. Usually you get shingles. So I, she may have I had, had a second infection or it may have reactivated as chicken pox. But that, it, that's it's very It's worth unusual. pointing out both of these viruses are in the same family. Ah, yeah, they they're both, both herpes viruses and, and have latent phases, which means they stay with you or as Saul says, they're forever. Right. That's the difference between true love and herpes. Indeed. That's right. So I think my my take is that you have a little bit of uh, immunocompromised uh, system, Amy. Yeah. You should be careful for sure. Yeah, that's I mean, right. And you know, you hear in the in the press about people who get very sick from H one N one flu. I suspect a lot of those have suboptimal immune systems. There may be a subtle change, a subtle mutation or change in a innate sensor or some other aspect of the immune system. So I would be careful. And She uh, specifically asks about the uh, tissue culture in lab yeah. and bacteria in lab. And I would generally think that the lab strains probably wouldn't be a problem for her, but do you have an opinion on that? Okay. Well, yeah, the E. coli that we use for growing plasmids. I was always told I could eat it for lunch. Mm. Probably okay. benign. Yeah. Tissue culture cells, <laughs> tissue culture cells, probably not an issue. But if you're growing viruses, I would be very careful. Yeah. But the E. coli in the cells, you're probably okay. With. By the but way, if, working in the lab, you probably do eat it for lunch and don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you should wear gloves and practice good sterile good technique. You know, work that's, in the hood right, with, right. with these yeah. things. And our last email is from Alfred, who is. Um, a physician and is in the emergency department in a medical center in Camden, New Jersey, not far from us. Nope. Love the show and highly recommend it to my colleagues. As an emergency physician, I've got to be honest and note that if the rabies case you described last month presented to my emergency department, I would certainly have missed it as well. Hmm. This is the case in California where the young man presented and turned out he had rabies he'd brought in from Mexico. So we were a little critical of the ER, but he's saying we shouldn't have been. uh, We'll read on. (laughs) I read the report, and the doc caring for that patient did a very, very extensive workup on him on both his presentations to the department, including multiple laboratory studies, IV hydration, 
and extended observation periods. Unfortunately, communication was through an interpreter, which is always a problem, and as the report notes, the family may not have been entirely forthcoming with his Mexican connection. All that aside, even if this patient showed with a T-shirt stating, I'm from Oaxaca, Mexico, I think I still would have missed this one. (laughs) In our department, we see this type of presentation commonly, but it is mostly related to adolescents smoking marijuana laced with PCP or formaldehyde. Maybe the marijuana comes from Mexico. (laughs) It's all a matter of perspective, I guess. Aggressive behavior to us means drug intoxications, not viral encephalitis. As a general rule, a confusing patient is more likely to represent an unusual presentation of a common illness than a common presentation of an unusual (laughs) illness. Like most of these cases, though, in retrospect, this patient did have all the hormones of rabies on his second visit to the ED. On a totally different note, I have an immunization question. If all the envelope proteins for influenza are glycoproteins, how does the virus synthesize the branched sugar chains and the atta- and attach them to the H and N proteins? And more to the point, why not simply make antibodies to the sugar chains and forget about the proteins? Keep up the great work. So we were tough on that ER. It's easy for us to criticize sitting here in an office in an ivory right. tower, right? So I understand, Alfred, exactly what you're saying. And we probably would have missed it, too. But uh, we need people like you to keep us uh, in line here. Thanks very much. Who wants to tackle the sugar question? Mm. How does the virus put the sugars on the glycoprotein? Well, the cell does it for it. Exactly. (gasps) Beat me to it, Alan. (laughs) Yes, the cell does it. I thought his best friend was the bacula virus. They collaborated together to actually. No, that's not it. (laughs) Yeah, so the, the viruses don't have the ability to do most of the things they need to reproduce and the, the sugars are put on by cell enzymes, and in fact, the kinds of sugars that go on, the H and the N of viruses are very similar to the sugars that go on cell proteins. That's why right. it's very difficult to make antibodies that would be protective, right? They would react right. with cell proteins, and that would be a problem. And also, sugars don't tend to be very immunogenic, I think. But some of them are extremely immunogenic. Some are very. Some can, yeah. Some are. And I, I happen, in researching this, I happened to find an antibody against a sugar group uh, it blocks HIV infection, for example. Yeah. So there are some examples, but for the most part, it's really more effective to make yeah. antibodies against the protein. It's also a heck of a lot easier. Yes. It's true. Uh, but pur- purifying and working with with carbohydrates oh, is, is an enormous pain. It's true, and except if you've got some really unusual ones. And Trichinella had one that was a lookalike for something on Salmonella Group D bacteria called Tyvalos. And Tyvalos turns out to be the most dominant sugar moiety on about half of the secreted proteins of trichinella. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you do a Western blot and then, f- and uh, rather a 2D uh, page first and then a Western blot on the 2D page and, and do it with an antibody made only against the Tyvalos, you'll light up half of the proteins on that gel. Mm-hmm. And the other half, of course, are not lit up. So it raises the question of what function these sugars actually play for a, a, a complex uh, parasite like, say, trichinella. But it shares the, the similar uh, sugar, except that it's in a different configuration on the uh, salmonella group D, does cause some cross-reactivity. So every now and then those two uh, serological tests come back positive where mm-hmm. only one is present. Uh, the, it, I've heard a wonderful presentation by a biochemist here who was a visiting uh, professor, who was actually in the process of determining what the role all of these decorated proteins were. I mean, that's what he called them, decorated proteins, because Mm. the sugars are added after the proteins are made, right? So what role do the sugars play for a protein? That just raises that general question. And his answer was that they degrade slower. Mm Mm-hmm. And therefore, they last longer. It's one of of the functions, yeah, has to do with that and folding of the protein also seems to be regulated by glycosylation. But a lot of microbes seem to use the sugars on our gut tract as recognition molecules to actually gain attachment. Which one, which famous microbe? Well, I I know one that I can talk about, and that's Entamoeba histolytica. (laughs) This one that we that we have been talking a lot about recently. It must be the H one (laughs) N. Yeah, influenza attached to sialic acid. Right. right? Sure. So sure. But you can't um, make an antibody to sialic acid and block infection. It's not very immunogenic, and even if you could, the sialic acids are all over the place. It would probably have secondary effects, right? You probably dilute out the antibody. (laughs) So. 
Anyway, thanks for your email, Alfred. Thanks for that sweet question. That's very good. And that brings us to our science picks of the week. And we'll start with Jennifer. So my pick this week is the website about the Art of Science exhi exhibition uh, hosted by Princeton University. And this is their third annual exhibition, and it explores the interplay between science and art. Um, this year's uh, exhibition is about found art. Uh, huh. And these are uh, images that are not just for art's sake, but were actually produced during um, a scientific research project. Got it. So uh, a viewer can go and look at this site and look at these fantastic images uh -huh. um, produced by real scientists. Uh, and uh, vote on their favorite art piece. Oh, it's very cool. They have all kinds of organisms and crystals and yeah. structures. Uh, I'm looking for some viruses here. I haven't found any. It really just shows you how beautiful science can be. Here and is, how artistic uh, it is. It is. This is. Uh, I know what that is. <laughs> what is that? Dick? It's not a. It's not. No, a, it's like slime mold. It looks like slime mold. No, it's an organ. It's a kidney. I think it's a tubule of a kidney. Oh, really? In the form of a spiral. <clears throat> ah, mouse mammary tissue shaped in a spiral. And embedded in a 3D collagen gel. Well, Ooh, there, it was beautiful. There was, I believe, over 200 different submissions. Um, what's wow. shown here is the 48 works that were chosen. I didn't. You can uh, vote. Uh, huh? Yeah, mm. I, as I was going through that, I didn't see one of nice of viruses this year. Oh, uh, 51 images, 32,400 votes. Wow. Nice. This is great. I've never seen this. It's cool. Yeah, you know, Science Magazine had something similar to this also with regards to images. Um, could and imaging. I think yeah, yeah. Imaging. Well, often in my own work, it's just nice. you just have sure. beautifully uh, aesthetic isn't, pictures. Jen, we never even asked you uh, what it did attract <laughs> you to Vince's lab to begin with. But actually, what attracted you to science? Was it the, the beauty of science itself? So, I mean, it, it happened, I think, too early in my life to say it was about beauty then. But but the older I've gotten, the more I've seen beauty in my work. You know, like it's, it's just beautiful that the interplay between the virus and the cell and... And I often think about it in, in a cartoon world, like the little viruses yes, with like yes. shields and swords, yeah, and yeah, and, yeah. and I, I so rarely get to see it. So when you get that electron microscopy image, or you see something glow, it's just it's incredibly rewarding. Right. I like that site. Very nice. Thank you. I'll put a link to that, of course. Right. Dick. All right. I'll give you my pick of the week for a book. I have a book in mind here. It's one I've recommended to my students in a course that I teach called Ecology 101. Uh, it's to sort of bring students up to date in terms of the real world out there so that they can uh, compare and contrast the way the real world works with the way public health has to interface with our populations to correct all the mistakes that we've made by mm -hmm. encroaching into the real world. Okay, So that was a pretty long explanation. I didn't mean to be so wordy. Uh, the book is called Diversity of Life. It's by Edward O. Wilson, and it's a wonderful uh, treatise on the diversity of life. <laughs> and I'm sure that he's got a little bit of a discussion in there about viruses because they are, by contrast, at the edge of life. And it's a, it's a very popular book, and uh, there's lots of versions of it out there. And um, the more beautifully illustrated that book becomes, the more seductive it becomes to students. Because I think, as Jen just mentioned, we're very visual in our approach to science. We like to see how a protein fits into the, the substrate or into the protein, mm -hmm. so to speak, if you're a biochemist or 3D pictures of, of, of gels and stuff like this, and uh, imagining, you know, uh, sections down through a CAT scan, for instance, to tell you how the body is put together. Uh, and this book gives you a visual picture, a running visual picture of the numbers of critters that are actually on this planet and how we are affecting their demise by our activities. And I think it's a worthwhile read. E.O. Wilson was an entomologist, right? He still is. Yeah. He's a still an entomologist. At Harvard? He was retired, but he's still up there. Yeah, he studied ants. He, studied, right. he studies ants, I should say. He does. He I've still had the, studies them? I have the privilege of having him in my office and talked with him for a really? while. Really? Yeah. How old I, is he now? He's, in, he's 80. No, he's exactly 80 years old because they celebrated his birthday at the World Science Festival this year. Very good. Dick, is it true once a scientist, always a scientist? You can't, you can't, you can take the boy out of science, yes. but you can't take the science out of the boy. Okay. That's, as you mature or out of the girl. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
once you've got the bug, there's no way to get rid of it. You incorporate that into your thinking all the way through the rest of your life. Thank you, Dick. Welcome, Vince. Alan. Well, my pick is a piece of software, um, which is not a point-and-click installation, but it's something that can be quite handy if you have to organize large amounts of information, which um, I know a lot of researchers do, and I certainly do as well. Um, and it's called MediaWiki. This is the software that actually runs Wikipedia. Um, so you can, it's open source software. You can download the thing and install it on your own computer. Um, but it's designed to run as a web application. So you have to actually turn your own computer into a, into a web server uh, serving oh. pages locally. Um, but once you do this, and, and it's not hard, there's a, a bit of a learning curve. Um, in administering something something like this, but uh, it's something that I was already doing for some some other stuff, and um, I also have put a, a link here for some instructions on how to configure a, um, a Windows PC to do it, and it's uh, it's even easier to do it with a Mac. Um, so you set up you set up your your computer to function as a local web server. It doesn't actually. It's not actually putting pages out to the whole internet. Uh, it's just when you're on the machine, you can point your browser to a local file, and it will bring up uh, your own personal wiki, mm. your own your own Wikipedia. Um, and uh, the the great thing about this is you can put all kinds of information in it. You can um, you know if you need to maintain a database of contacts of people you're in touch with, you can put in not just the usual name, address, phone number type of fields, but you can put in um, you know, if you have a, a notes about uh, how many times you contacted this person and what about, or uh, a summary of their research, or a photograph, or anything along those lines, you, it's it's Wikipedia essentially. So you can put all that sort of information in there, um, and it's uh, it stores all the data in a database, so it's very quick to search. Um, and anyway, it's it's something that I've found to be an incredibly useful tool, and I think um, probably some of our listeners would too. Yep. I have used it to set up a public wiki, which you can also do. You can put it on a public server. Right. And um, there are also all kinds of uses. So, for example, one thing I was thinking of doing was to set up a wiki listing all the virology labs in the world. Because often my students oh, say, who works on virology in Chicago? And I have to mm. think, but if you could go to the website and just click on Chicago and find all the virology labs. It nice idea. Good. I'll do it in my spare time. That's another project. That's cool. I like that. And my my pick is a website called Nobel Intent. It is a <laughs> science site produced by Ars Technica. I don't know if any of you have heard of Ars Technica. They're, yes. they're known for their technology reviews and news, mostly about computing and IT and so forth. But they also have some good science pieces. This is a, a part of the site that deals with science. And they have good science stories. I'm looking at one right now. H. pylori alters its environment to move through the stomach. And uh, NASA asteroid tracking program stalled due to lack of funds. Galactic <laughs> evolution. <laughs> Impending doom. So a lot of good science. Good, good science writing there. So that's uh, Nobel intent. And that will do it for another TWIV uh, Jennifer, thanks for coming back. Thank you, Vince. And now you're off to D.C. really. You've moved I really around. am, yes. Great. Is that a promise or a threat? <laughs> well, a little joking, of both. I hope just you know, joking. You know, I can remotely be on the show again, I'm sure. Absolutely. Future. Just pull, out, pull up actually. Skype. You've been and, a wonderful uh, addition these last two times, so I, I vote for permanent placement. Absolutely. We'll, sure. we'll be in touch once you find out what uh, being in the private sector is all about. Uh, That'll it, be fun. It will be fun. Good luck. Thank you. Dick, as usual, gracias. Uh, de nada. Tricanella.org. Con mucho gusto. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Very good. Tricanella.org. That's right. Or medicalecology.org. Okay. Oh, expanding your empire. I uh, had it all the time. Alan, you just never asked. The web empire. <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, what's his name be next? Uh, Rupert Murdoch be, be contacting you to buy your, your website? Rupert. Oh, brother. We won't go there. Okay. No Twitter for Dick, though. No, not a Twitter. Alan, thank you. Quite welcome. Always good time. You can now go and resume your weed whacking. Alan, okay. how's how's the construction on your house coming along? Uh, well, the house is already built. It's the uh, you know the little repairs and such that need to be done. Well, then how are they coming along? 
Um, reasonably well. <laughs> They're going to be going on forever. You it's can, an ongoing yes, task. Yes. It's never done. Out. A house, you take the lid off and you pour yeah. money into it. Yeah, yeah, and you yeah, close right. the lid and you do that yeah. on and on. Alan blogs at DoveDocs.com. And you can also follow him on Twitter, Alan Dove, all one word. And you can follow Twiv on Twitter, P-R-O-F-V-R-R. I used my own name for it, my own nickname, but it's it's a Twiv follow. And we also have a website, twiv.tv, where you can see show notes, all links to the stories that we talk about, and uh, other things that I can't think of at the moment. <laughs> and of course, if you want to see other science, po- listen to other science podcasts, go over to sciencepodcasters.org or promednetwork.com. And there are a bunch at both of those sites, and we're members of both. Thanks for listening, everyone. Do send us your questions, comments, trivia, stories, as we love it. We love to hear, and we love to talk about it, as you've seen. Twiv at twiv.tv. You can email them to us. You can send us an MP3 file, as we heard today. Or you can also call up Skype, Twiv Podcast, and leave a voicemail. And tell us what's on your mind. You've been listening to This Week in Virology, the podcast all about viruses. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Another TWIV is viral.